This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. All right, this is the practice squad, and we got a lot of work to get done today. Strohs has concerns about the organizational structure of the Lions. He wants to tie it into Houston. I'm going to tell you right now, I understand where, like, I see the dots you're connecting, but I do think you're you're connecting dots that maybe don't belong together. I feel oh, like you oh, were oh. going to be there all day long for that because everything has been going on with Houston and everything that's going on with the Texans. Like, oh, that's right I mean, in your wheelhouse. You're definitely a conspiracy theory kind of guy. And that's what you're doing here. Uh, and I, 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 I see the dots. Like, I, I honestly, I make fun of you a lot. So we're going to get to that. Um, I have a theory myself related to why I like the TV I like. And I'm going to be honest with you. I was watching Gossip Girl last night while I came up with it. <laughs> so we're going to get into that. But the most important oh, question amazing. of the day, and I have been genuinely waiting to ask you this question all day since the, the, the press conference of Dan Campbell. Strohs, how turned on were you <laughs> listening to Dan Campbell speak? <laughs> because I don't have to have – we've not talked about it. Let's be clear about that. We've not. We've had no prior conversation. And I know damn well that that 90-minute press conference was your favorite thing to happen to the Lions in a long time. <laughs> All right. So here, I'm actually – I'm pulling up the messages right now. So as the I, I listened to the I listened to the press conference on a delay because I was at work and I had to listen to it on my lunch and I had to kind of bounce back. Uh, I listened to probably about 45 minutes of it. Okay. Um, that's I, a lot. I, yeah, I couldn't get back to it just because things were going on with work and I was at work and they're like, oh, you got to have headphones on. I just, I hate working in an actual office. I hate having a grown up job. It sucks. All right. So, uh, so I was texting, I was texting John and cause he was there covering it for SI. And I, I basically, I told him how much I love Burkett and I love Rothstein because they just don't care and whatever, Cal you know, Mon- like Mikey dropped an S bomb in the, in the press conference today. Yes. Yes. I mean, it was in. <laughs> Well, quoting what Dan Campbell said, but mm-hmm. still pretty great. So I said, also, Dan Campbell has a little bit of petty because he brought up Matt Campbell. So he's like, I was like, Dan, Dan, Cam-, or I was like, Dan Campbell has a little bit of petty and he is super unrefined. I kind of like that. And then as he kind of went on, he got super emotional, super choked up, which I love when, I love when a big burly dude gets a little bit choked up and then he dropped an S bomb and I was like, yeah, okay, cool. I, I like this guy. What really turned me on, Talked though. about biting off kneecap. Yes. <laughs> what uh, What really turned me on was when he started talking about football. And he started talking about his philosophy about football. About putting our best on their worst. His philosophy about football is that he doesn't have one. Other no. than he's just like, we're just going to beat you. Yes. Uh, pretty much is what it is. But, like, I was like, I kind of, like, started to buy into it for a second. But then I had to tell myself, like, so, like. My emotional brain was like, fuck yeah. But then like my actual brain, like the thinking part of my brain was like, hey, calm down. This guy has no idea what he's doing with X's and O's, and he's got to go hire some coordinators. And that, I think, is where we both throw monster flags. I'm going to be honest. I think that that's a concern that you're not all in on this because you don't use your thinking brain. When it, when it comes <laughs> to you don't. Because here's the thing, Stroh. I expected to come into this podcast. And have you love and up and down this tire with no concern oh, in the first awesome. segment, and then somehow go into the third segment and have alarm sounds going off for you about the, the lions being in disarray because that's the kind of person you are. You, I mean, we've done a podcast what maybe uh the start of the season, so five six months ago ish, where where you like both ripped apart the lions and then projected them to win the division. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's there's no thinking that goes on for you. Here's what I'm going to say. I, I didn't love the Dan Campbell hire from the start. I'm all, I also don't hate it. Um, he's very clearly, like, if we know why this hire was made. Well, I think we knew why the hire was made before today, and we learned even more so today. Uh, one big thing is, I, I think after the failure that was Matt Patricia, this organization wanted to bring in less of a, a, a rocket scientist and more of a leader. And I think there's some value to that. I think it's a little risky because it, it, it puts such a heavy uh, requirement on your coordinators, and coordinators are fragile. That's something I've always talked about. Like, the Atlanta Falcons went to the Super Bowl because of Kyle Shanahan. I don't think there's any questioning that. That offense was special. And then when he left, that team has not been the same since. And look at what San Francisco does. 
So you can have that success. I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Lions can't have successful years under Dan Campbell. It's just fragile. And, and then today he showed you part two of why. He knows how to win people over. I think he's going to win players over. I think he's going to win fans over. And you know he won ownership over. Oh, yeah. He's a super gregarious, charismatic guy. Like, he is a guy who, he says, hey, I need you to jump. You say, okay, cool, coach. How high do you want me to jump? He's just that kind of guy, and he projects that, and he he just oozes that. Like, you got that through the press conference today. I'm super nervous that this is a head coach that your general manager didn't really know before you hired well, him. Well, I don't, so I'm going to be honest, because you mentioned to me, we spent maybe, let, let's pull, pull the curtain back here. Yeah. Normally, before we start a show, we probably talk for 10 minutes. Does mm-hmm. that seem fair? Yeah. Today, we talked to you. I yep. knew we had some really good stuff to get into, so I didn't, I didn't need any free show talk at all. You said some of the stuff today gave you even deeper concern mm-hmm. about what we're going to talk about in segment three. I actually think we've talked about being open to hiring a coach first, GM first, whatever else they wanted to go. I think the way they talked about it today is actually very interesting. Basically, they said they had a list of finalists before Brad Holmes was hired. And Brad Holmes agreed from that list of finalists to Dan Campbell. If that's accurate, if the information they shared is truthful, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with ownership saying, here's a list of guys we really like. Who's your guy? See, that makes me a little bit more concerned because it's ownership telling you, hey, here are the five guys you get to pick from. Pick one of them. And you're like, I really don't like any of these guys, but okay, we'll go with this guy because I know probably the most about him. And I think he might be a good fit for for me. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about the hierarchy because I want to save that for, for right, second we'll three. Second three. But it, it's, I think that's a, that's something that, again, I could see this working. I, I want to be fair. I could see this working, but I am nervous and I have a ton of reservations about all of this. And it's because your head coach doesn't have the X's and O's part of it, right? He hasn't been a head coach before. He's done some interim work with my, Mi- with Miami Dolphins. Uh, he is a guy who, he he is a rah rah guy. He is he is basically the captain of your football team. That is what he is, and that's fine because we both know as a head coach, you've got to do a thousand other things. You're not necessarily worried about play calling. You're doing a hundred other things. You're handling a lot of different egos, and you're handling a lot of different personalities. He seems like a guy who's perfectly fitted to do that. The thing is, if you're going to be that guy, you better hire really really good coordinators who know what the hell they're doing. And they've already gone out, hired their defensive coordinator, who has zero head coaching experience, and they're going to slot him in as their new DC. Now you have to go find an offensive coordinator, and what it looks like they're doing is they're they're interviewing wide receiver coaches, interviewing quarterback coaches, basically everybody and anybody who's not a previous I, OC. I this is like going I to be saw, a very inexperienced team as far as I the coaching goes. I feel like I saw today, and maybe I'm wrong, a, a former head coach on the list uh, of uh, coordinators that they were bringing in. Was that, was that incorrect? I've not seen that. I, I know uh, it has been primarily inexperienced guys. There's no yeah. doubt about that. I thought I had seen one name and go, gone, huh? Yeah, I, I don't know who had it, so I, I, I can't confirm that one way or the other in the moment. So um, I know they've interviewed the, the Steelers wide receiver coach, and I know they've interviewed uh, the, the Ravens quarterback coach. I've not seen anybody else besides them right now. So you might have a different list than I've seen. I'm trying to see if I can find it right now because I, I'm, I don't, I don't remember. And I understand that being concerning. Um, I don't know, man. Like, the reason guys usually hire former head coaches when they're new is because they want the, uh, they want someone to lean on. And, and I think if the Dan Campbell experiment is going to work, I almost think that that's just, that can't be that way. Like, he, he recognizes what he brings, and I just want the best teamers at offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. And if that's somebody new, I'm game for that. I, I understand the concern. I, I guess in a, in a small way, I like it because it feels like diving all the way in to, um, it's diving all the way into, look, we're just going to get guys who are good at what they do. And, and I'm gonna lead because that's what I do. I'm a leader. And, and if you're, if he's a, a great leader, he, he, um, is believed to be and that he portrays himself to be, I, I don't know that you need to lean on another former head coach. I, I just think it's incredibly risky when you look at the experience level all the way around of basically everybody here. So you've got a, a first time head coach, you've got a first time GM, 
you've got a first time defensive coordinator, and then if you go out and you get a first time offensive coordinator, this this season, this first season, is essentially learning on the job. It, it's basically take your kid to work day, and the kids are going to do everything. They're pushing the buttons, they're pulling all the levers, they're making the phone calls. So there's going to be a ton of ton of mistakes. There's going to be some issues that are going to arise. It's just can you overcome those then? If you're if you're such a good leader, and this is going to really test his mettle, if you're such a good leader, are you going to be able to overcome those with those 53 guys in that locker room who are going out there laying it all on the line every single week and are trying to win games? Was it Anthony Lynn? Anthony was Lynn that, was the, yeah, yeah was the name that I I, I saw I, earlier today. I just seen that one. So to me, like. It shows a, they're certainly willing to go to a former mm-hmm. head coach. And Anthony Lynn's one that would interest me, but not, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of think where I'm at on this is, is pretty much where I've been this whole time. I'm curious. I'm not in love. No, nobody's, nobody has gotten me super excited, but I, the one thing I'll say, I, I don't necessarily care about the, the biting the kneecaps off or whatever. That was fun. Mm-hmm. It was comical. Um, he was very funny during his press conference. The, 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 the whole thing with Matt Campbell, the biting the kneecaps off. There was a lot of humor. And like he, honestly, he, he went in there and, and to use a, a wrestling term, he power bombed the press conference. Like he slammed it through the mat and I he mean, got every, the three count. Every Detroit Lions beat writer was saying it's the best press conference they've ever been to. Yeah. But, but what I was going to say is I do believe, and I've heard this, you know, I worked with a former football player. It's only one guy I know personally, but. And he has said, when it comes to football, if your locker room doesn't buy in to, like, your message, it is very, like, you could have some talented players, you could be a good football team, but it is very, very hard to be a special te- team if they don't buy into your message. And I like that he has a clear-cut expectation for the personality. The, you know, he says, we're going to take on the, the, the field of the city. They're going to be gritty. They're going to be... You know, Detroit versus everybody. He didn't say those words, but like, when someone That's tells you, upset. when, when somebody tells you that they're going to take on the, the attitude of the city of Detroit, you know what it means. Mm-hmm. It's going to be tough. You know, I fully expect the N. Campbell coach team to be very high on the penalty. And whether or not you believe that's the ideal message, I think it's very clear there is a message. And I think there is a kind of guy that they're going to want. And I, I do think, I do think that matters. And I don't know what the right message is, but I'll tell you this. If I have to pick between the team that's a little too dirty and the team that's a little too clean, um, cause Houston down here, that was a big thing. They, they wanted, uh, they wanted guys who didn't have personality issues at all. Nope. I don't care, man. Give me, give me the guys who are too tough. As long as they're in it together, I'm here for it. And so like, I'm far from celebrating the hire. I'm far from celebrating the press conference. That was the biggest selling point to me. He was really funny. I, I have maybe a little bit of concerns. Like he says there's going to be a ton of transparency and I know fans are going to love that. I, you know, like, I, does he need to say today that he's not excited about the defensive uh, talent? Like but that, I, that, did you not love that though? No, I, I love don't. That. I don't love that because if you're a part of that defense and you're still here next year, two years from now, three years from now, I don't think you want to hear that. Like they can hear that. He can say that to them. But no, like that's the kind of transparency. As a fan, I understand why you want it. But me personally, I want guys on that team to, to feel like they're a part of it. And to me, that that's not a message you put out publicly before you've coached a damn game. As a player, I would love it. Let me know where I'm at. Let me know where I sit at all times. Personally, that way I can publicly. achieve whatever that level is. I don't care. Like that unit is trash. We all know that unit's trash. But never, that unit was. Here's the thing. I understand if, if they, they played for him. I understand if they go out and give up 42 points if he says our defense is not good enough. There's not like these guys aren't talented enough. I would be like, whoa, whoa, but I, I would get it. He hasn't coached a damn day. He hasn't coached a game. He hasn't coached a preseason game. He hasn't coached a practice. So the only said was that he wasn't as excited off. about the defense compared to the offense. That was it. Like I don't like. That's, that's not necessary. I guess it's not necessary. But what I'm saying is, if I'm in that locker room, I love that. I love that. I love to know where I sit as a, a player safety. with my head coach. Unless you're Spencer Wiseman. <laughs> I, I think what it does, though, is it tells you that this is going to be a guy who he's going to be brutally honest with you. If you don't like it and if you have soft feelings, prepare to get them hurt. He's going to be a guy who's just going to tell you how it is. And I think if you're a player, I think you respect that. Well, I don't Matt know. Like called out Darius Slay early on in his career with the Lions. No, and he was respond. disrespectful about it, though. He was completely. Not there's a, there's, are you 
Dude, he said he said, what are you doing? Sucking that guy's dick? That's what he said. That's disrespectful. It's absolutely disrespectful. You know what else is disrespectful? Saying that you don't think the defense is talented before you spent a day with them. It's a different type of disrespect. I, I, I'll give you that. But it's still, if I was a part of that defense, let's say, I, you know, I, who's the best player in the line to do that? I know it's not yeah, an easy tough. question. That's tough, dude. Uh, we'll say okay, Romeo Okura. That's going to be around. Is that okay? Let's use Jeff Okuda. If I'm Jeff Okuda, and I know he, he's expecting me to be here long term, he still has expectations for me. And I hear in an opening press conference before the dude has coached a single practice, I'm excited about the offense, but let's, what did he say? Uh, God, I wish I had the words in front of me. Basically, let's I think be honest. It was, something, it was something along the lines of, I'm more excited about the, the pieces I have on offense than I am on but defense. He said, let's be honest, I'm more excited about the offense. If I'm yeah. Jeff Okuda, I'm saying, this guy hasn't even spent a day with us and he's gonna talk, like, he's gonna say that. Like, he's gonna be open about the fact that we're not as talented. That to me, that would be disrespectful. That would absolutely. And you know what I would tell you? You know what I would tell Jeff Okuda? I would say, hey, go look at your stats from this season. You guys gave up more yards than a team that went 0 16. Sorry. Sorry. Like, sorry, not sorry. Don't get your I, feelings hurt. We, we gotta get moving on here shortly. I just don't get how you don't. Real quick. How that can lose somebody. Oh, no, I, I, I see how it could, but at the same point, just be better. Like, in this case right here, your defense was historically bad. Oh, for, my your, for your stopped. new head coach, no one wanted to play no, like ab- absolutely incapable. You've never absolutely. coached me a day in your life, and you're going to tell me that we were bad. Yeah, because you guys were. Like, I got 16, I got 16 you games of footage. Play. I don't even play for them. <laughs> <laughs> Here, well, before we move on, real quick question for you. Is uh, Colin Cowherd compared him to Freddie Kitchens? Is he going to be, is Dan Campbell going to be more Freddie Kitchens or more Mike Brabel? I don't, what, what the hell am I basing that on? Press conference, basically. It's all you got, bro. That, that, that coin I don't flip? Have a point on me. I have, I have, I have a remote control. A remote control. If, if it lands on this side, he's more Mike Rabel. If it lands on this side, he's more Freddie Kitchen. Okay. Really so not. if it lands on the, if it lands on the button side, he's Mike Rabel. Well, I need to show you how this just landed because we can't, we <laughs> can't record it in the podcast. This is how it landed. On the script. <laughs> it landed on its side. <laughs> it's legitimately 50 50. It's too early to tell, boys I and girls. Tell you, we have no information. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this much. I hope he's more Mike Vrabel. That's for too. damn sure. I do, too. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to Gossip Girl, right? Um, Again, we're going to get back to the Lions because we know you don't want to listen to Gossip Girl talk. And it's not Gossip Girl talk. I just had a theory about why Hold I on. like the show. What, what is bro? Gossip Girl? What is Gossip Seriously? Girl? I don't know. I don't watch this stuff. Um, I, I, How do I describe it to you? It's, it's the kind of TV I like, man. It's, it's targeted at, like, 18 and, like, 22 women. It's, it's my kind of show. And I'll tell you why in a so, second. Again, we're going to get to the Lions again because Stroh has concern about the organizational structure. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, they're a, uh, maybe a tad young at the start of the show, but I'm deep enough in at this point. Um, the answer is yeah. You don't feel, you don't feel bad watching it and being like, yeah, I will. They're not even like way too young at the start. I think they're like, I think they're probably 18, 19, maybe even early 20. Sure, sure. No, I, like, not, like, if, if, if there's, hey, if there's grass on the field, you can play ball. It's not creepy. It's just, like, I don't know. I, I, you see it younger and it's, a, it, it is a little bit, like, weird, but yeah, they're, they're attractive. They're, dude, it's TV. Of course they're attractive. <laughs> um, but so my theory to why I like these kind of shows, this is not the first one. The other one, I'm sure we've talked about it on this podcast before that comes to mind is Vampire Diaries. Big fan. Um, I realized last night while watching, Gossip Girl. <laughs> you watch. <laughs> There's one thing they do better than TV that's designed for you in these shows, or, or you know, we'll just say men. And and it is character development across the board, like a, a long, like um, I'm trying to think. This show probably has seven, eight main characters, and every single one of them, I'm in like the second to last season. Every single one of them is both like wildly different now than they were at at the beginning, but like. You saw them grow. Like it, it wasn't like a, a flip of the coin. Like just, you realize, like holy crap, like these are different characters now. And it's funny because like I don't know that it's the best storytelling. It can be very cringy at times. There can be some storylines that are just like hard to not lose, like to just stop watching because of how cheesy it gets and over the top. But I think for me, I'm I, like I've realized what I like about TV. Like it's the characters. Like I want to. um feel like the characters are, I mean, essentially my friends. Like, they're people you know. 
and like you like to see their growth and like you root for their growth. And and so I just don't think like the the two shows that came to mind that that were like all time great, um, definitely more targeted for me. Um, Breaking Bad, for example, really good show. I think highly overrated. Um, but what Breaking Bad did so well is that they had incredible character development for the main character Walter White. And, and I felt at times it was kind of stuttery. It was just like I did like it just seemed like he jumped forward, jumped back, jumped forward, jumped back. Um, but at the end of the day, like he, he became an entirely different person by the end, and you saw it happen. But beyond him, I, my favorite character in that show is not even Walter White. It's Jesse. He grew quite a bit too, but it's like those are the only two characters, and, and it just it doesn't do it the same way for me. Uh, the other one, Game of Thrones, neither of which you've watched, which kind of hurts this segment. Um, but Game of Thrones, now Game of Thrones, is like one of my favorite TV shows of all time. So this is a bit different, but Game of Thrones um, spent the entire damn show telling you who Daenerys Targaryen was, and then shitting on it. Like she she showed all this growth and who she was. Like she, they, they spent this whole damn show. That was the so, hot dragon chick, right? Yeah, showing you what kind of person yeah. she was, and then they just she threw it out the crazy. window. And, and it's like, why? It's not the only reason. There's a lot of reasons. The last season plus sucked, but like, I just don't think that show is meant for people like me and you, Strohs, do as good of a job on character development. So when we were kind of putting this together and we we're kind of discussing it. We didn't really go in depth on any of this. You're just like, hey, I got this segment and I like this show, and I was like great you like girl shows i can laugh at you yeah i can laugh at you but as we're kind of working our way through it i i understand what you're saying because you're gonna laugh at me i'm i'm big into anime right like i I love anime so like the only thing that turns me away from anime is how like you have to you have to get past how freaking cringy some of the stuff can be early on yeah and if you get enough in you're fine so my favorite my favorite anime is is Dragon Ball. Anything to do with the Dragon Ball franchise, whether it be Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super, I don't care for GT. I think GT sucks. But some of the best growth that you see is with arguably everybody's favorite character, who is Vegeta, ends up coming to coming to the planet Earth to basically destroy it, and in the end he becomes one of the biggest saviors of the planet, and he's got this really weird relationship with the main character uh who is goku and goku is is the main character and there was a lot of growth with goku early on but at some point it just kind of stagnates and you get a ton of growth from vegeta all the way through up until dragon ball super where it's now kind of stagnated again but it's that growth and it's that development that gets you hooked and gets you to buy into the character and you feel every emotion yeah, there's a like there's any character investment that's what it's all yeah. about yep out of curiosity, blind curiosity has nothing to do with the, the topic. Have you watched Hunter Hunter? I have not. No, 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 no. Okay. I have not. I started watching is it that. Good? Well, so I'm not an anime guy at all. Okay. The only anime in Kill Hunter Hunter that I had watched all the way through was um, a Death Note, which Death Note was incredible. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that was that was the one I was gonna bring up next. Death Note is yeah, Death Note's fantastic. amazing. That's a great one for character development. Yes, I, I, mean, I guess absolutely. in that one you really only see it with with uh, is it L. It's been a minute. Um, yes. Light. Not Al. I think it's Light, right? Whatever his name is. The guy who plays God. Um, you see a ton with him. I enjoyed this, like, the strategy back and forth of that. No, Hunter Hunter, I started watching for that girl in, in the middle of summer because she was a big fan. And then I freaking loved it. Great show. Um, but you mentioned a couple shows while we were setting up this topic. Pretty much the only thing we prepped at all was this topic. You mentioned SCIS. Yes. And, and so, that's you know, I'm a so huge fan of SCIS. Yeah. So I, I like I think all three of the NCIS, whether it's the regular NCIS, whether it's NCIS Los Angeles, whether it's NCIS uh, New Orleans, there's so much character development there. So like Gibbs himself, right? The show has been going on for roughly 17 years, and this man has this long, winding, complicated backstory, which is why he is the way he is now to this day. I'm a huge fan of Michael we- Weatherly. He was uh, he was um, Tony Dinozo in the show. If you go back to the very, very beginning, you can even go back to that Jag season where he showed up and guest starred. The character development of Tony Dinozo until he leaves NCIS is in- insane. It's incredible. Same thing with McGee. I love Ziva David, and she was fantastic. Like I was, like I think I cried when when she got written off the show, and then when she came back, I cried again because I was like, "Oh my god, she's back!" So 
Like the NCIS does such a good job giving you these weird, complicated backstories. Now it is formulaic. That is the one problem I do have with it. So, so here's the thing. We've talked about this before. Like you have a thing for formulaic shows. Mm-hmm. I think formulaic shows are almost an exception to the rule, and the fact that you like them a lot makes me wonder if you would like my show. Like if you could get past the the stigma of who it's for, it makes me wonder if you would like it because. I also very much enjoy Formula A shows. I, I watched a lot of NCIS growing up, but I haven't watched it in a long time. I watched a lot of uh, Criminal Mind, uh, House, all these shows, Psych, where it's like the I same episode House. over and over. They're all great. But the thing is, they entirely lean on character development. There's really little else there to, to, to hook you in, because every episode is the damn same. Like, you, you know everything that's coming. The only reason you're hooked is because you want to see... Um, the way the character relationships and, and the way they grow and, and that kind of stuff. And so, like, I don't know if this is unreasonable of me, but, like, I want to ask you to watch one of my shows. Like, that's, that's really where I'm at right now. I'm like, dude, I think you might like, like, TV made for 20-year-old women. So here, here's a show that is, it's a CW show. And it's a show that I got, that's, <laughs> it's a show that I got into the, I got into the first season a lot. Um, it was, before because of my love for CW shows. It was over quarantine. Uh, it was called In the Dark. I think you would love In the Dark. It's about this blind Problem, chick. She's she smoking doesn't. hot. Yeah. She's smoking hot, and uh, it's about her and her friends. And It's a very interesting show. Um, there are some moments where it is very cringeworthy, and it's about her trying to figure out who killed one of her really good friends. Mind you, she's blind, and she has trouble getting around, and she's a functioning alcoholic. So th- there, there's a little bit there. I think you would absolutely love it. I think it's a good show. I wasn't able to get into the second season. I wasn't able to get into the second season uh, just because they ended up bringing in this drug dealer and it kind of messed with my anxiety. And I was like, ah, it's a little bit too real life for me now. And I was like, mm. so I've kind of pumped the brakes on it. Now, my brother-in-law. You had that experience it. with a drug dealer? Uh, I mean, I got shot by one. That's how he got shot. <laughs> um, but besides that, I mean, no. <laughs> I was, I was curious, like, I wonder if you didn't watch Breaking Bad. <laughs> um, so, I, look, uh, uh, let, let's do this. Uh, I will try this weekend to watch, uh, what, what is the show called? Well, here's the problem, because I have two that, like, well, my all-time favorite in this genre is Vampire Diaries. However, yeah. I think you would have a very tough time with the first season of that show. I did. Um, the first season of that show is, um, way more, like, Ro- rom- I don't know what to call it. It's like too much romance. Romance was a big like factor in all of these shows, but it, it's like all all of that in the first uh, season of that show. Um, and, and the current one is Gossip Girl, but I, Gossip Girl's on HBO, so I'm guessing you're not going to be able to watch that. Ooh, yeah, probably. It's not on Hulu at all. I don't know. It had been on Netflix until the new year. It just moved from Netflix to HBO. Um, so are they still doing like get the seven days free of HBO for like trying? HBO, Probably. whatever. I'm sure they do. All right, so I'll, I'll try to figure it out. It's called Gossip Girl, right? Yeah, how many episodes can you give? I don't know. How many do I need to give you? Give me a season. How long is a season? Is like 20 episodes? episodes? <laughs> you made your girlfriend really so you're, have a single episode of this show. You're taking up my entire weekend here. Whoa, I, you don't need to have it ready by next week. You can have a month. <laughs> All right, so Gossip Girl. I gotta watch You don't Gossip gotta give Girl. me a whole season, but like, if you feel bored, power through at least a couple episodes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give I'm gonna give this a legitimate shot. I'm gonna try to watch this. We'll reconvene. I'm, I'll I'll kind of text you as the weekend rolls along, and I'll let you know where I'm at. You're enjoying it so much that you have to get the HBO subscription short term. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. I know no one I'm, listening I'm, to us agrees with me, so I love feedback at Brendan and Riley underscore on Twitter. Um, give me some examples of shows that do like high end character development on four, five, six characters. Uh, one example would be Friday Night Lights. Like, but I told you, favorite show of all time. It does an incredible job on character development. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what does it good TV for me. Alyssa it's says not, that's a great. It's great. She says it, I have to watch it, and I refuse. All time great, number one for me. But um, I guess Why what I want to say real quick before we move forward. Um, I kind of think that that's the difference between TV and a movie for me. If I want great storytelling, I want to watch a movie. Um, but there's only so much character development you can do in, let's say, two hours. Mm-hmm. When you have a show like Gossip Girl that I believe is six seasons, it might be seven. Um, 
you're talking about, you know, a hundred plus hours to develop these characters. Uh, I just think it, like, movies for me, I want great storytelling. TV, I want character development, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. And I totally understand it. Are you, have we talked about this before? Are you more of a movie guy or are you more of a TV guy? I am more of a TV guy. Um, it's weird. So, I get into, like, moods where I'm very TV-heavy, very movie-heavy, back and forth. Mm-hmm. But when I'm movie-heavy, it, it normally means, like, I need a break. Like, it's very rare that I put on a movie and I'm totally engaged in it. It's actually why I love going to the movie theater, because I can get myself to fully engage in it. But if I'm watching movies at home, a lot of times it's just, like, um, something in the background to not pay much attention to and just kind of, like, totally disappear. It's funny. I'm the same exact way. So if it's a, like, I love going to the movie theater and I will totally get invested and I will get sucked in at the theater at home. It's really, really difficult. It's got to be a great movie. But TV is really not hard for me to do in. that with. No, me neither. TV could be on. And I'm like, oh crap. Next thing you know, two hours have gone by and I'm still stuck there. And I'm like really interested in whatever I just, just was watching. So no, I'm same boat as you. It's crazy. Are we good here? Before we get We're back to the line? Yeah. Some some place where I don't know if we're the same boat or not. It's it's what's going on with the front office of these Detroit Lions. Yeah. So I I mean, go ahead and lay out your concerns in, in the organization and, and the structure, I guess. So it's really weird to end up in this place compared to where I was last week when we had this conversation. Last week when we had this conversation, I was very pro all of this, the way they're doing things, the way things were unfolding, and now you fast forward and you've made your hires, and all of a sudden I've got. I've got a ton of concerns, and I want to start at the very, very tippy top, all right? I want to start with Rod Wood, and he's kind of the linchpin between all of this, between the Lions and what's going on in Houston, and and you can speak to what's really taking place with Houston uh, with Jack Easterby, but Rod Wood has seemed to, over the course of roughly six years, strong-armed his way into this position in this organization where He's the head dog. Watching the last two press conferences play out, when they introduced Brad Holmes and when they introduced Dan Campbell, at numerous points in the press conferences, he basically told Sheila, without saying sit down and shut up, he basically told her to sit down and shut up. Now, that being said, Sheila is absolutely awful in front of an open mic. She is brutal. Like, nobody should talk to her ever. Like, put her in a box, put her someplace. They should not talk to her because she does a really, really bad job speaking in front of the public. And she's usually ill prepared for any questions that the beat writers throw at her. They threw a question at her today about why there's, why there's such a disparity between uh, hiring white coaches and hiring black coaches. And she had this awkward laugh that was, it, it was, it was, she said they were colorblind, didn't she? Yeah, she did. And <laughs> she's too I, old to understand that that's, you gotta dude, be careful saying that. She is, she is the epitome of white privilege. Like she just doesn't get it. It's lost on her. She's like 70. She just doesn't understand. It's it's crazy. But at this point, Rod Wood has worked his way into such a position where he now tells the owner what to do. And Rod Wood was a guy who six years ago came out and said, I'm not a football guy. I don't know anything about football. I want to I want to say this really quickly. Well, mm-hmm. before um, we go to I, I, I understand. Like, I, I know that there is a type of listener who's going to have a hard time listening to you go through this because you, you sound like a, a hardcore conspiracy theorist. And, and, and I, I just want to say, like, I, this pros is speaking for himself here. We have very crucial disagreement. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sure. I just, I, I know. No, yeah. Like, I listen to you, and, and I, I empathize with you in this case because I, I know where you see it. But if I didn't see those same dots, you would be driving me crazy. So, Rodwood, at this point now, is the head man in charge. Fast forward six years. He's now the head man in charge. He basically is the guy who hires Brad Holmes. Uh, he's the guy who has his fingerprints all over this organization. And the way this, the way I'm understanding this, this front office being situated, you basically have Rodwood at the top. Chris Spielman is somewhere circling. He's like, he's like the moon orbiting earth. Like he's around, but he's not really around. And he pops up every now and again. He's there. And you then have branching off underneath Rodwood. You've got Brad Holmes, but to the left of Brad Holmes, You got Mike Disner. And all of a sudden, I had no idea who the hell even Mike Disner was. He's a capologist that is a holdover from the Patricia Quinn era. Like, why are you holding guys over? Now, granted, Disner is the guy who found Brad Holmes, which, pause, 
makes me a little bit nervous about everything because the guy who is basically responsible for you getting your job here is now your equal or your your counterpart. No. And that, that becomes no, a little it becomes a little bit difficult later on. I could I, see I could see some issues here. So okay, I, I don't necessarily see this one as, as much of a concern. When you're talking about massive organizations, sometimes there's lateral movement. Like, mm -hmm. not everything's a chain. A, a capologist is not the boss of a GM. A, a capologist, at most, is, is a lateral move. Like, they're not super tightly woven. No, no, right. But that, but that's, and, and maybe it's just old world thinking, right? Where your GM is, is basically the head of all the football operations, right? He is the, he's the head man in charge. You know, you look at the way, say, the Red Wings are structured. It basically begins and ends with Steve Eisman. I would expect something similar with the Detroit Lions, but it doesn't work that way. You basically have this triumvirate with, and then you have Chris Spielman somewhere circling around. It's like there's okay. four people in charge. There's such a, a disbursement of, of power and authority and, and just the way the food chain is broken up. Can I tell you the it's way that crazy I crazy to me. Yeah. So uh, this is where you're starting to sound. You just need to see this. Like, conspiracy theorist people, like, have a need to have those answers that we don't well, ever technically get. Okay. Well, well, I'll let you get into that. Just let me, let me draw the correlation to what happened with Houston and Jack Easterby. So, I see Rod Wood and I see Jack Easterby very, very similarly. You've got two guys who aren't necessarily football guys. They've got a little bit of a, they, they've got interesting backgrounds, we'll say. They somehow okay. work their way into the organization. They grab the ear of the owner. And next thing you know, these guys are in these okay. spots where they there's, have so much control. There's some key major differences that I think maybe you just don't see because, like, you're not here in Houston. Jack Easterby has no football background, much like Rod Wood, but he also has no business background. Rod Wood is a business guy and right, a team president, but team presidents typically are business guys. So Rod Wood, I know it scared people when he was hired, but at the end of the day. Most team presidents aren't super football guys. They are business guys. So Rod Wood was much more qualified to begin with. Jack Easterby was a character coach before he was hired. Uh, Jack Easterby was also directly tied to the general manager that was hired. Him and Nick Casario have a, I mean, Nick Casario said it in the press conference here, they have a great relationship. Rod Wood doesn't have that with Brad Holmes. I also think that, so that, those are the key differences there. Like, Rod Wood is qualified to be a team president. I know he doesn't know football, but but I don't think he's making football decisions. And nothing we've seen yet suggests that. In fact, a capologist being the one to bring to the attention of the president somebody, to me, is a good sign, not a bad sign. Because a capologist is at least rotating in this football world, unlike the team president. Uh, uh, and you just spoke to how, how ownership doesn't know how to do this. To me, Rod Wood's job is to to kind of be the liaison between an ownership who doesn't have any idea what they're doing and a football staff who knows the game of football and he's kind of his job is basically to work between those two. He understands the like he said it. He, the reason he's qualified for this job is because of his relationship with the Ford. He knows what they want. They don't know how to get what they want, but they know what they want. His job as a business guy is, is to to basically act as ownership. Because of his relationship with the Ford. Does it not scare you at different points in the press conference? The, the beat writers asked questions, basically how the hierarchy of the organization works. And Rod Wood basically said it's, it's all of us coming together to make a decision. So like, it, it, it's not Brad Holmes. It's not Dan Campbell. It's not Mike Disner. No, it, it's, no, no. it's, it's not just Rod Wood. It's all four of them having to, to make a decision. Hey, Rod, you just said Rod Wood is not a football guy. No, I don't but, want but Rod, Rod Wood making any decisions on football. Rod, no, that's, see, that's the thing. At the, the people, what, can I just pretend that Rod Wood's the owner? Cause basically what sure. I'm telling you, in this situation, what I'm telling you is Rod Wood is acting as ownership. Because of his relationships with the Ford, he is acting as the owner. And the owner is involved in decision making because the owner has, like, it's their money, it's their team. Now you don't want them to be too involved. You don't want them to be Jerry Jones. But at the end of the day, if an owner says, we have an issue with this type of person, like, they have to be in that room. There's no football team in the league where ownership isn't in the room. Now, could they possibly be too heavily involved? Maybe. I'm not going to write off that that possibility. But them being in the room doesn't concern me. Um, throwing back to today's press conference as well, um, Dan Campbell said, 
he wants a general manager who's going to be, you know, who's going to battle with him on guys. They don't want to be on the same page on everything. To, like he said, we're going to go into the room, we're going to fight it out, and, and best man wins. And I'm obviously paraphrasing, but my point is, I have every expectation that that roster decisions overwhelmingly will be made by Brad Holmes and, and, and Dan Campbell. And, and Rod Wood may occasionally say like, hey, this person has this problem. Hey, this person said this thing. There's something we don't like about these guys that, that they don't do it for us. But I don't have any reason to believe that that's going to be the norm. I'm going to say this. Watch this closely. I think I think there's a possibility this could work out, right? This is something different, something so different. We've not seen anything anything really like this in in professional sports, at least here in the Metro Detroit area. We've not seen anything like this where you've got such a you have it you have a front office with lacking so much experience and you're trying to separate and give everybody a little bit a little piece of the pie to make decisions. All right. But don't be surprised if in the end these things don't work. And when the whole whole deck is cleared and the whole house is cleared, Rod Wood's the only one standing I and Rod Wood is the one who has all the power with Unless they don't hire a GM, Rod Wood can stay through every single regime. I don't care if my team president, as long as he's not making personnel decisions, he can stay as long as they want him to. It really doesn't bother me. And here's another major essential thing that, that like you, you miss because you're not here. Jack Easterby has been with this organization for a year and a half, and Mm -hmm. there's report report after report after report after report after report of players who don't trust him. Of mm-hmm. players who believe he runs the organization. Of players who felt like they couldn't say certain things around him without them losing their job. Rod Wood has been the team president, as you said, what, for six years? Yeah, about that. Have we heard a single report of a player feeling like he was in charge? No. I just, I, I, I don't think they're fair comparison. I just think after watching the last two days, it, he's just been so heavily handed in all of this. And look, I get what you're saying where he's acting on the behalf of of ownership. I get that. I understand that. All right. Especially after seeing ownership parade herself out there and, and look like a complete buffoon. I get what you're saying. My thing is you came out and you cut your own legs out from underneath you a couple years ago saying that you're not a football guy. And now you're going to be the guy making a ton of football decisions. It, it, it causes me to be worried. And I'm telling, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you. This could work out. All of it could work out. And I could just would be, you? I could be over here just freaking out for no reason. Would you be but don't be surprised. What, say he has football experience? Well, to me, saying I'm not a football guy says I'm not handling football decisions. Right. But now here we are. Fast forward six years later. He's making all kinds of football decisions. No, he's not. He's making decisions of the guy who's hiring. Yeah, that's what and, 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 do. Wait, How do you think GMs and coaches get hired around the league? Do you no, realize I get it. the vast majority of owners aren't football people and they still hire GMs? Right. I get that. But if you go back six years ago, he wasn't the guy making these decisions, and now all of a sudden he is. And like I get, I get that things have changed hands. It's gone from Martha to Sheila. I understand, and I just, and I just lambasted Sheila. I understand. But what I'm telling you is, his power has grown over the last six years. Somebody has to hire a general manager, right? And it should and be your, it should be your ownership. Somebody who doesn't know anything about football. Does it not? Is it not weird to you that what most what most teams do when they need to when they Basically, broom everybody out. You need to find a GM. You need to find a head coach. You go out and you, you, you hire a firm, and the firm does a search, and then you go that way. I can that tell didn't you. Hap- that I didn't can happen. Tell you, Houston, they got murdered for firing oh, yeah. a firm. They did. For, sure. for hiring a firm, they got killed for it. Now, I don't like Chris Spielman being the guy that they hired to do that mm-hmm. because I think Spielman, I mean, you want to talk about it. My, my biggest concern is that Spielman hired himself. Dan Campbell is, oh, is, yeah. is it's, an image of Chris Spielman. For sure. But, but like, as you have, have an issue with all these guys, like to me, that's what Chris Spielman was. That's this organization recognizing that ownership doesn't know anything about football, and the president doesn't know anything about football. So what do they do? They hired a football guy to come in and be the football guy to help make these decisions. I don't know. I'm just I'm nervous about the way things are going to play out with the way this front office is constructed right now. Let's move down. We'll see. We do got to wrap this up here shortly, but but you had we got into it a little bit. You have some organizational concerns even moving down the ladder, correct? Yeah, so you you now you you go to uh to to Dan Campbell and the way him and Brad Holmes like these guys I feel like they like when you're in the football circle like you're in the football circle right so you kind of know of guys and you know people but these guys have one never worked with each other before they said 
Uh, and during the press conference, Ian Campbell's like, yeah, we basically hung out till midnight, just kind of getting to know each other and talking to each other. And I'm just like, whoa, it's like so hypocritical. It, dude, it's, Anytime it's such former Patriots were brought in. It was a it was a death sentence. No, no, no. I, I'm not saying I, I'm not saying I don't want former Patriots here or uh, anything what? like that. But what I'm saying is this was this was obviously an arranged marriage. Right. No, I don't think it's obvious. You don't think it's obvious? You think these guys, single... these guys have, these guys have no experience with each other. So you think every single GM has experience with the coach they hire? I think every GM has a short list of guys that he wants to work with. And I don't know if, I don't know if Dan Campbell was on Brad Holmes' short list. And that's my concern. It was said in the press conference. And here's why, like, this part particularly, like, I don't have strong feelings one way or other about what we heard at the top. To me, it just sounds normal. I actually feel pretty good about the way they went about hiring Dan Campbell. Because what I heard is ownership came up with their finalists. And, and the reason Dan Cam- Campbell was a finalist is because they interviewed with all these GMs. And the list is long. We talked about that last week. Mm-hmm. Very long list of GMs they interviewed. And Dan Campbell was a name that kept coming up over and over and over again. Maybe I'm crazy here. But it seems safe to guess that if Dan Campbell's name came up over and over and over again, he was probably on Brad Holmes' list as well. I mean, it's possible. but. Again, you said it yourself. The way it was presented is, hey, here's our short list of guys. Who do you like? And then Brad Holmes has to look at it, and he's like, uh, all right. Yeah, Dan Campbell sounds good. Let's go with that guy. You know, it's we again, we don't know, and we won't ever know. That's we your perception. No, but that's that's exactly what they said. That's what that's what Rod Wood said. Said that's um, how it was. Dan Campbell, uh, yeah. That, is, that, is that how it came off? That, that I mean, Brad Holmes was like, I guess I'll, I'll, guess I'll work with it. That's, that's how I read it. Yeah, your perception. That's what I said. <laughs> but the way no, what what Rod Wood said was, "Hey, we had our list of guys. We presented it to to Brad, and Brad said, yeah, we can go with Dan Campbell.' And Dan Campbell was hired. They said, Dan, uh, they said Brad Holmes agreed that Dan Campbell was the guy. They didn't say he settled on Dan Campbell. It's, I I just I don't know, man. It's, of course, I mean, I'm not. They were never going to say that, right? But, but I just. This is where, like, every business in the world, ownership still has to sign off on decisions like this. Yeah. This is at such a high level, ownership has to sign off on it. So if, if ownership had a group of guys that they really liked and, and they wanted Brad Holmes to work with it, I'm sure he was told that before he was hired. And, and yeah, there's only 32 GM jobs. Maybe maybe you pass it up or maybe you don't pass it up. But but I just tend to think this, you know, Brad Holmes knew what he was getting into. He knew that they, they had a short list before he was hired and he felt comfortable with that short list. The, the, I don't think you take the GM job of the Lions if you feel like you're handcuffed. I think that is an organization you do not mess with if you're handcuffed. I love how you're so optimistic and I'm so pessimistic. No, I'm not about though. All this. I'm not though. See, like that's no, but compared I, to compared to me, you sound like rainbows and sunshine. Because because I don't I don't need to connect dots to create something that I don't see. I wish you were here so you could see it. I'm gonna put this on distance. <laughs> no, like, would you agree you're kind of a conspiracy theorist? Not in this circumstance. I'm fairly certain you said on the podcast before yeah. you are a conspiracy theorist. I am a conspiracy theorist. Yes. That's what this is. Generally, when it comes to sports, though, I'm not. Like, I'm not oh, a guy who's, oh, I'm not a guy yeah. who's there like, hey, the league's trying to screw the line. No, I'm not, no, no, I'm no. not that not guy. In that way, but I, I, I'll start pointing them out. Look, <laughs> here's the thing. I'll tell you this much. I always root for radio and I always root for a good story. Something for us to talk about, right? And something juicy and salacious. Somewhere we could sink our teeth into it. Right? And you can tell that you root for it because boy do you see it when it's not there. I find them everywhere. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you know what's funny? A lot of my friends say, like, uh, I'm trying to think of how, uh, the way they put it. Like, I'll make statements and they'll be like, like, Brandon, you're just, you're just being a radio guy. And what they mean is you're being too hyperbolic. Mm-hmm. And, and like, sure, like, that's true. It's very, like, I'm a hyper, hyperbolic person and I became more so because of radio. I think that's what happened here. It is maybe you had a natural tendency to to, to gravitate. <laughs> I see it in your face that you you think I'm right. You have a nat- natural tendency to gravitate towards conspiracy theories, and then you want them to be true because they're good conversation pieces, and so you find yourself doing it a little bit more than it's fair. So you're saying I'm super hyperbolic? Is that what you're saying? Like I'm more well, hyperbolic I'm, than you? <laughs> no, oh no, you're not nearly as hyperbolic. <laughs> I'm just saying you're a conspiracy theory fan, and so you want to see great stories, even if the stories aren't that great. I don't Rod know. Wood, it, Rod Wood counting dollars and cents, and you're, you think he's a football mastermind who's not a football mastermind, but a, but a, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Like over here, Jackie could be the snake. He, I he's wish the I, guy who 
weaseled his way up the organization. And we have literally no basis for believing that. And I somehow wish people that's see top it. Yeah. Just so, over here shaking my head wide eyed. Well, yes. I wish I could have seen you when I started explaining how, how you're, you're trying to fight conspiracy theories because the space stream guilty, guilty. <laughs> If we Here's were the in thing, a court right now, you would you would be guilty because they saw your face. Here, they didn't hear anything else. Here's the thing. I I'm gonna be interested to see how this all plays out. Like like being and serious right now. Being 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 absolutely coach, serious. You're gonna blame it on Rod Wood. Probably will. Because I hate Rod Wood. There's no reason Rod Wood should be a part of this organization. Go be a banker someplace else. And four touchdowns, and you're gonna be like, the problem here is Rod Wood's making all the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Rod Wood's the one who called that play action. <laughs> Rod Wood needs to do a better job coaching up this defense. Why the hell What's he Rod doing up there counting why pennies? Why the hell Rod Wood play? <laughs> when in reality, all Rod Wood did is raise the price of beer 50 cents. <laughs> all right. I'm going to 